This is my backyard. This is a giant rain tank in my backyard. And this is my water bill. I replumbed my house so that all the pipes are now filled with pure rainwater, and this is how I did it. Not only am I about to show you how to install a 30,000 gallon rain tank in your backyard, but I might just get you to think about where your water comes from in an entirely different way. The first step of this project was to prepare the tank site by building a huge steel retaining wall that would allow me to place the tank subgrade. I made a dedicated video just for that project. I'll put a tag in the corner of the screen if you want to go watch that when you're done with this video. After I built the giant steel wall, it was time to make the ground as level as possible. And I did that using a whole lot of sand. So let's go get some sand. So while we watch how this tank was built, let me expand a bit on why this tank was built. In Valentine's week of 2021, the Texas power grid shut down during an ice storm that our infrastructure just frankly wasn't equipped to handle. A consequence of the power outages was that some of the pumps used to pressurize our municipal water stopped working. With the drop in water pressure that occurred due to those pumps stopping, every small crack in the municipal water pipes became a potential route of contamination. Normally, when all the city water pipes are pressurized, any small leak only ever allows water to flow out of the pipes. When the water pressure in the pipes drops though, these cracks become a potential inlet for dirty water to enter the pipes. This meant that in the setting of a huge blackout, with sub-freezing temperatures and no heating, our water providers had to recommend a boil notice on top of everything. This left my family without power or water during a week of freezing temperatures. Not ideal. Benjamin Franklin said, when the well is dry, we know the worth of water. We die without water after just three days. It's a strange phenomenon of supply and demand that the cost of water is low when water is plentiful, but it becomes almost infinitely valuable when it's scarce. In the big freeze of 2021, bottled water ran out in every store in our city almost instantly. The boil notice that was advised was hard for folks to accomplish since the power was out across the state. For several days, there were a lot of scared people desperate for clean drinking water. It is in those times that we should consider the value of having your own water supply. In my region of South Texas, I live just on the verge of the desert. I am optimistic that humanity may have the ability to reverse desertification, and I will expand on these thoughts in other videos I plan on making soon. But optimism does not blind me to the fact that in a region of the world that keeps getting hotter every summer, there may be a future where having your own water supply becomes a matter of safety rather than redundancy. I consider the time and money I spent on this project to be a hedge against drought, zombies, and climate change. All right. So we got six inches of sand in place now. It's roughly level, but it's not compacted yet. So as I step on it, there's still a little bit of squish in it. So the next steps are gonna to be to rent a vibratory plate compactor, go around, make sure it's all compacted down real nicely. And when that's done, I'm gonna use a little more sand to kind of fine tune everything. And then I'm backfill around the outside edges of the wall here. So let's go get a compactor. Anyone that might want to embark on a similar project should know some rough numbers. For the average 2,000 square foot roof, each inch of rainfall can lead to the collection of about 1,000 gallons of water. This is a conservative estimate, and that's still a lot of water. When collecting rainwater intended for drinking, the name of the game is keeping the water as clean as possible before it is stored. This avoids the need for excessive treatment or filtration later on. In similar fashion, it is poor form to put any chemicals or toxins into the water on its journey to your tank. This guides most folks to use a metal roof for rainwater collection since shingle roofs can potentially leach chemicals into the water as it flows down the roof. I got about an hour's notice this morning that the guys that are the certified installers are ready to come out today. So the tank team has arrived and I am as giddy as a schoolgirl. I think the plan because of this narrow passageway leading through my front yard that connects to the backyard uh, is so narrow. I think I'm gonna hitch the trailer up to the front loader of my tractor. In Texas, there are laws that protect your right to collect rainwater. Last I checked, an HOA is not legally able to stop you. I would argue that if you pair rainwater collection with a safe gray water infiltration system, there is literally no logical argument against rainwater collection, environmental or otherwise. Of course, that doesn't stop some backward laws from existing in some regions. Please do your homework before you invest in a collection system. What I do in this video might be illegal where you live. And if it is, feel free to forward this video to your local lawmakers and show them how effective rainwater collection can be.
do me a favor, don't smash the thumbs up button, please, be gentle with it. Poor tiny little thumb down there, just look at it, begging to be gently clicked. In all seriousness though, if you find yourself enjoying this video, I need your help. It took me over a year to gather all this footage and assemble it into a video. And while I enjoyed every second of that, I would be honored if you would help me out by subscribing to my channel. It will help nudge YouTube to compensate me a bit for my time. And if you find yourself wanting to see more videos like this one, I might be able to move away from my day job and toward making more content like this with the support of anyone generous enough to head over to my Patreon page and support me there. Any little bit helps, and the link is in the description. And there it is. Ain't she a beaut? It is a humbling thing to spend the better part of three months of your life preparing a site for a construction project. And then in about five hours, a team of four dudes goes ahead and they put this impressive thing up. They made it look easy. This is a standard ladder. It unhooks. Technically, you can flip it around and put it down inside of a manhole. Uh, there's an access panel on top. We're going to see in just a second over here is the overflow it's a big old pipe because you don't want that to restrict flow if you got water flowing in you want it to be able to get out easily so it doesn't put any pressure outward that the tank's not designed to handle and then down there is what they call the outlet that's basically just the standard fitting that will feed water to my filters and pumps i ultimately plan to have my ladder here that will make climbing this a lot easier there is the manhole and there is where the water goes into the tank just a few days after the install of the tank, we got a heavy rainstorm and the water coming off the roof hit the sand and I wanted to show you guys what that looked like. When water falls off of the roof of the tank itself and lands down here in the sand, it creates a pattern that risks undercutting the actual surface of the wall, which is right here. And if you cut underneath that, the wall becomes unstable. So we're gonna lay some rocks to act as kind of a dispersing structure so that the water doesn't splash into the sand. Some of y'all may have noticed this ladder in many of the previous scenes. I picked it up at a local recycling center. So I just slapped a coat of silver paint on it so it kind of matches the tank. I just used some pavers I had lying around to kind of level the thing out. Now it's time to weld up a custom pump house along this wall here, and this outlet is what's gonna feed the water into the pumps and filters inside of said pump house. The dimensions I'm going for are basically the height of the tank. I'm going about 10 feet wide. I'm gonna bring it out about three feet. And ultimately I plan on insulating the sides and the doors. I'm gonna leave the back wall basically connected to the tank with no insulation in between. My reasoning being in South Texas, we only get a couple of freezes a year. This huge volume of water, assuming the tank is relatively full, will be a nice good thermal mass, which will, should never freeze. And so by leaving the pump house in continuity with the water tank itself, it'll actually prevent the pumps and filters inside of the, the pump house from freezing. At least that's my hope.
All right, so I wanted to bring us out of warp speed here to give you kind of a post facto explanation of what I've been building. This here is very obviously the pump house. I got a door on each side up top. We got a little redneck lock made out of PVC. As y'all could see, I got pink insulation, one inch thick. Got that at the orange store, along with the metal siding or the metal roofing technically that I used for siding. I got everything as insulated as possible. And I use pipe insulation to seal the roof material against the tank itself. A design consideration I had to keep in mind was to make sure that any of the metal from the pump house itself, I did not want it actually touching the tank wall because that would lead to galvanic corrosion since a lot of the stuff on this pump house I'm not painting and it's going to rust. I want to make sure that it rusts here and it doesn't sacrifice the anodes that are buried underground as part of the tank install. And the whole point of all this was to have this tank outlet come to pipes that's going to go to a pump a pressure tank and a series of filters and then the filters the filters are going to be mounted on this back struts on the wall and you can adjust these struts to whatever dimensions you need to to make mounting the filters easier going back out the other side of the pump house last thing i got to do is build a small extension Coming out here, I'm gonna have one leg go down. I'm just trying to keep my walkway nice and wide. That's why I scooted that ladder as far over as I did. And I need the extension because when I go to clean out the filter underneath that black plastic cap, I wanna be able to stand safely and soundly on a platform while doing it. So we're gonna go back up in a time lapse to see all that get done. And it's painted, but there it is, all said and done. You almost can't even tell I did anything. And this is the plastic cap through which a PVC pipe will pass on the center point and that'll dump the water into the tank. This is a stainless steel filter. You clean out leaves and small debris from this every once in a while. So the next steps here are gonna be installing electrical wiring, pumps and filters into the pump house and then doing some gutter modifications and PVC work to get the water to convey from the gutter of my workshop and the gutter of my house down through the ground in an underground trench. And then that PVC pipe will pop out of the ground right next to the ladder here and then ultimately dump down through a hole in this cap and pour through the filter. But first it might make sense to do a simple lab bench demonstration of how exactly that works. This is my lab bench. Yes, I'm using a child's toy. Don't judge me. So there are several different arrangements that can be used to get rainwater from your roof to your tank. One of the simplest ways would be to just put the tank under the downspout of your gutter. This isn't ideal though because it means your tank has to be right up against your house. Another way is for you to build something like a ramp for the water to flow down, often called an aqueduct. This allows you to put the tank further away from your house and still use gravity to fill the tank. The downside of the aqueduct setup though is that you have to build a large, somewhat complicated structure above ground. The aqueduct structure also takes up usable yard space. The third and most commonly used setup involves a tank located some distance away from your house and the use of a U-shaped PVC tube. The U functions much like a siphon does. The horizontal part of the PVC U is buried underground so that it's out of your way. For this to work, two big things have to happen. One, the PVC tube has to have watertight joints. And two, the vertical leg that flows into the tank has to be shorter than the vertical leg that comes down from the gutter. As long as the outlet that feeds into the tank is lower than the height of the inlet that comes from the gutter, the water is essentially flowing downhill into your tank and no additional pumps are needed. A height differential of at least 18 inches is advised to provide enough force to push the water into your tank. Let me show you how this looks in real life now. Here we have the PVC fittings that are most commonly used. As you can see, we use long sweep tubes 
so that it doesn't build up a lot of resistance to flow. Four inches is a very common size, uh, much more affordable than the six inch apparently. And to anybody looking to buy this stuff at home improvement stores, it's commonly called drain pipe or sewer pipe, and the thickness of these walls is called Schedule 35. So with the use of a trenching machine, we cut big trenches through the yard and buried a network of four inch pipes in said trenches. Four inch pipe is apparently kind of an industry standard. Like I said a second ago, six inch pipe is significantly more expensive, so it's much cheaper to use four inch wherever possible. After we plumbed all the downspouts into a common pipe that goes up to the inlet in the top of the tank, we got a heavy rainstorm. This storm made it apparent that we needed to make some modifications because there was a ton of overflow coming off the tops of the downspouts rather than flowing through the pipes and up into the tank. So after some thinking, I concluded that there were two big problems. One, the pipe diameter was too small, and two, there were too many bends. As you can see, there's a 90, a 45, another 45, and then up top here, there's another 90, another 45, and then another 90 going in through the cap of the tank. Me and my installer concluded that was too many turns in too small of a pipe. So the solution we came up with was to increase the size of this pipe to a six inch pipe and then have two independent pipes go into the cap. To do that, I had to weld some custom metal stuff. So let me show you what I came up with. I got some stainless steel pipe on McMastercar.com. I went with an eight inch size, a six inch size, and a four inch size. Each of these pipes is about a foot long. Then I took the black plastic cap, that's the lid to the tank, and I marked the circumference of the eight inch pipe on top of that and then I cut a hole in it that exact size. Then I swapped out the caps. The one that had the four inch pipe went away and the one that had the new hole cut in it went in place. Then it was time to line my pipes up. I passed the eight inch pipe up and down through the hole like a chimney and I had to line up the six inch and the four inch pipe you see me holding here at the right angle to where I could have the up pipes feed water in through them. So the trouble I was up against is I couldn't run the four inch pipe and six inch pipe parallel because the added width of them would be too big to fit into the eight inch pipe. So I had to plumb the four inch pipe in at some angle. If I did a right angle like this, it made this long length that had to run over the lid of the tank and that was kind of silly. So I had to wind up figuring out a way to cut custom cuts into these pipes to where I could line them up at an angle just about like this. And so I came up with a pretty neat trick that involved lasers. It was really fun. I made an independent video for that. But let me show you the gist of what I did. So using a special type of paper called cyanotype paper and an ultraviolet laser, I was able to kind of make a template by wrapping it around the pipe and then running the laser along a template pipe that was the diameter of the eight inch pipe. And it basically burnt the image of the tracing onto the smaller pipe and then I was able to cut the custom shape and weld them together. I wound up having a very nice joint when it was all said and done so I was very happy with the results. Then it was time to swap out the wire in my MIG welder to stainless steel wire and then I went to town welding these things together at these custom angles. And this is the new manifold in place. I went on Amazon and I got a rubber cap that fits on top just to keep bugs out and then you're able to buy these pre-made sock filters that I put in place with some stainless steel mesh that had a custom hole cut in it and this little stainless pipe here just holds the filter in place. Here you can see rain flowing into the pipes. And this is an image of when I'm cleaning out the filters. You just pull the sock filter out and you can clean off the gunk with your hand. And then you put the sock filter back and you're good to go. And this is how it all wound up looking. I was pretty pleased with the end results. Take note here of where I flared the four inch pipe up to the six inch size a little bit before the turn to go upward into the tank. Like I said, we did this to reduce resistance to flow significantly in the up pipe. And so far it's worked very well. And since I'm a boots and suspenders kind of guy, in the event of an overflow, I didn't want water spraying out of my gutter and then soaking my rocket mass heater on my porch. So I came up with this idea to divert the overflow safely down to the ground level without making a mess. First, I cut the original pipe. Then I glued on a joint, and with the use of a rubber joiner, I was able to hook up this custom PVC piece that I made that looks a little bit like an elephant trunk. And in a second here, I'll show you how it works. So this is the final overflow piece in place. Normally this green pipe is full of water at a level that lands right about here, 27 inches down from the gutter. In a heavy rain event, as resistance to flow builds, this column of water rises. 
All of the downspouts on my house contain a water column of equal height since they are all connected to each other. As the water here rises and spills out of the side branch on the sanitary tee, this path through the elephant trunk diverts the water down to the ground and should prevent all four downspouts from spraying like sprinkler heads. If it works, you will never hear about it again. If it doesn't work, I will post a follow-up video to warn you all that this idea failed. And if you want to be alerted to these follow-up videos, you should definitely click the subscribe button and turn on alerts in YouTube settings. This is where the water comes out, down here. It just flows onto the ground. And this little branch is a tattler device that tells me if the pipe overflowed during a rain event, even if I'm not here to see it. Droplets of water collect in this cap. Now that we've built a system that can deliver rainwater from my house and workshop roof into the tank, it's time to talk about how we're going to get that water from the tank into the plumbing inside my house. Let's follow the journey water makes going from the tank through the pipes and into my house. First, the water has to get out of the tank through this bulkhead fitting. You'll notice it's at the very bottom of the tank. Despite all my screen gutters and pre-filters, there is a small amount of sediment that inevitably gets into the tank and settles down to the bottom. Because the occasional leaf debris may float on the very surface of the water, the cleanest water zone winds up being about 6 inches below the surface of the water. If you pull water straight off the floor, you are likely to suck up sediment and clog filters very quickly. So I plumbed up this special floating filter that pulls the water exclusively from 6 inches below the surface rather than sucking silt off the bottom. You can make your own out of all sorts of clever parts, but I was feeling lazy, so I just bought this online. As soon as the water is out of the tank, it goes to the pump. There are many different types of pumps one could use. Some require a pressure tank and some do not. To keep things affordable and powered by 110 volts, we went with a pump that does require a pressure tank. Which brings us to this little blue guy here, the pressure tank. Its job is to act as a pressure reservoir that prevents the pump from having to cycle on and off super frequently. Once the water leaves the pressure tank, it's onward to the filters. These filters get progressively finer as water moves toward the house. The first filter is called a spin-down filter, and it uses inertia to fling the larger particles out of the stream of water and into this collection bowl. The finer filters are up here. There's a 5 micron pre-filter. This removes small debris and some of the larger bacteria. Then there's a 5 micron carbon filter that removes any chemical contaminants. And the last stop is a 0.2 micron electrostatically charged nanofiber filter. This removes even the smallest bacteria and also removes 99.999% of viruses, which are the smallest potential pathogens. In my house, there is a strict rule that we only drink or cook with water coming out of our reverse osmosis filter, also called an RO unit. The RO filter inside the house filters down to 0.0001 microns, which is smaller than the smallest known viruses, which are about 0.02 microns. If you don't have the same RO filter rule in your house, you should add an ultraviolet sterilization unit to make sure that any potential viruses are killed before they leave the pump house. I wanted to avoid that in my setup because I didn't want to have anything in here that requires power other than the pump itself. But do your own research to determine what you need and always follow codes and laws. At this point the water goes underground and runs through the same trench that the gutter pipes were buried in. The water pipe then joins with a spigot pipe just outside my workshop. Since this pipe connects to the house plumbing, the water basically enters my house from here. We placed a backflow preventer here to prevent city water from accidentally flowing into my tank in the event that I ever turn on the city water up at the street. Once the rainwater joins this pipe here, it feeds into all the pipes in my house and it flows out of every faucet, toilet, and shower head. A safety feature worth mentioning is the fact that we installed a backflow preventer out by the municipal water meter that makes it impossible for my rainwater to flow into the city plumbing. This feature is both logical and required by most municipalities. It's one of the many safety mechanisms aimed at keeping the city water clean. This little guy also has to be inspected on an annual basis to keep up with the rules. And that about sums it up. Believe it or not, plumbing your house to rainwater is that easy. What is that easy? I want to give a big thank you to Jeff for helping me through this process. He put in a lot of hard work and he helped guide me through everything that I took part in. If you're interested in getting a tank like this, I'll leave some information down in the description of this video that'll help get you started. I think the world would be a better place if we all felt a stronger connection to it, even people who live in suburbia. Hopefully, this video demonstrated that you don't need to move to the boonies to be a boon. Rainwater collection is possible anywhere with a roof and a yard. If you enjoyed this video, please remember that I can't keep making them without the support from folks like you. So please click all the thumbs and subscribes and maybe even head over to Patreon to see if you want to help me spread this message by becoming a personal donor to the cause. Thank you for watching Suburban Biology. I'll see you on the next one.